All right, welcome. Let's get this panel started. My name is Omar Shaker. And today we're going to be talking about innovation in medicine. I've been going to digital health conferences for a little over 10 years now, and sometimes it feels like we're going in a loop, still trying to talk about adoption, still trying to talk about how to get over the barriers. And uh, quite frankly, I'm tired of talking about the problems. So today we have three very interesting people really shaking healthcare at its core and trying to, we're going to try to kind of maybe demystify what it takes to implement technologies and uh, you know how, how you guys were able to get through or break through and um, hopefully we're going to open up some um, more more solutions than the barriers that we already know exist and I know all of you have done that and continue to do incredible things so uh, let's just start with a quick round of introductions if uh, I can start with Tamsin tell us a little bit about who you are and what your story in uh, innovation medicine has been so far. Oh, thank you. Hi, um, I'm Tamsin Holland-Brown. I'm a paediatrician and I work in Cambridge in the UK. And um, I, in fact, I saw a problem. I didn't really mean to go on the innovation journey, but here I am and I, I'm loving it. But I just was able to see that in, I was given the children who have hearing loss clinic and I was doing that and at the same time had my other paediatric clinics and was able to see the overlap over many years of children who had a hearing loss, particularly that most common type of hearing loss, which is where they get a cough or a cold and they're really blocked up. Um, and then starting to see children coming through into my other paediatric clinics with learning difficulties, speech and language difficulties, other developmental delays, and realising that we then needed to do simple stuff early. So just vision and hearing support early for children makes a lifetime worth of difference for them. It enables them to learn and develop their confidence and be able to read and um, not to think that they're naughty because it sometimes acts out in behaviour. And so I, I was wanting to solve a particular problem in, in a type of hearing loss caused by a condition called glue ear. And so I then developed um, some assistive technology for them to hear at a very affordable price, but also an app uh, to help them not slip behind in their development and also to monitor their hearing at home. And then because that has been so hard and all of those barriers that you were talking about, Omar, I ended up um, realising that I needed to really champion digital health and what it could do, particularly for the paediatric population. And so have ended up being um, part of that journey uh, with, with a lot of my work. So much, Thames, and um, I look forward to digging deeper into how you did that exactly in a second. Aditi, it's a very exciting time for you. You just came from Vegas. I know you have a lot of uh, great news in terms of your career. There's a lot of new uh, new clients that you have. There's uh, also you come from a health health system background and has able has been able to. Uh, help a lot of health systems implement telemedicine and kind of break through these barriers too. So tell us a little bit about your journey so far and um, what's on your plate right now. Thank you. Uh, my name is, so I am an emergency medicine physician. I'm American, as you can tell from my accent. Um, I joined a startup telemedicine in 2013. And at the time, similar to Tamsin, nobody wanted to hear about it, right? So it was very hard getting any of my uh, colleagues to think of it more, of, more than a passing fad. And then in 2016, I uh, took over and started running telemedicine for a very large academic center in uh, Philadelphia. And through that, aside from just doing telemedicine, we were able to pilot and look at digital health in general, see what kind of pilots we wanted to use, take our telemedicine programs and determine, hey, how are we going to expand this? What kind of outcomes do we want to see? And to really try to incorporate it into every branch of medicine that we could. So it was a really great experience to learn how to do that, try to convince patients and then physicians, and then obviously during the pandemic that changed everything drastically. And then in the last year, what I've been doing, as Omar alluded to, is a lot more consulting work, uh, taking that knowledge and determining with startups, okay, what's their strategy? If you want to be integrated into a health system, how do you do that? What are the clinical outcomes that are relevant? And what do you need to know that clinicians want to hear about? So that's really exciting for me to even be on this panel and hear about this because it is a real passion project of mine to uh, talk and be uh, talk on behalf of clinicians because I think we are considered a barrier to innovation, but that's simply not true. It's the perception, not the reality. Great, and uh, as as uh, far as I understand, you are in the process of writing a book about that, or co-authoring co a book? 
on That's telemedicine be, success. It'll be out next year. So. And it's going to be published by Forbes? Forbes, yeah. Right? Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. I, I look forward to hearing more about uh, kind of, yeah, what, what models have you seen work? Um, and we'll get back in a second about outcomes. Jonathan, um, tell us a little bit about, about yourself and what's on your plate these days. Yes, hi, my name is Jonathan. I'm a physician and um, the company that is on the, on the screen is not the company that I, where I work at. I don't really know that company. <laughs> just, before, just for everyone, <laughs> in case anyone wants to ask me about Three Bridges, no idea. So um, my name is Jonathan. I am a physician as well. Um, so I started my journey in the medical device industry. I was a CEXO for a major Dutch um, medical device manufacturer. And then I was uh, the chief medical officer of a wearables device uh, company. Um, I was also pushing the, tel the tele-rehabilitation um, before COVID pandemic. And uh, as you had the same experience, nobody wanted to hear about it. Um, and then COVID happened and then my phone didn't, didn't stop ringing um, because of the necessity of remote services. So also experienced in implementation of technology. Um, I've worked before in several projects at several hospitals, including Cleveland Clinic, uh, Mayo Clinic, uh, Charité, uh, King Mohammed Rashid in Dubai, uh, in Sao Paulo, I Albert Einstein, basically in lots of countries, implementing technologies from the array of uh, cardiac radiology, cardiac rehabilitation to implementation of artificial intelligence in ECG, uh, especially in the Holter and uh, REST ECG type of, uh, of projects. And I'm also the co-founder with Diana von Stein, which is uh, in, the, in the audience uh, of Lapsi Health, which is a company that is trying to revolutionize the way we use auscultation and sound and um, how we can apply it into medicine and level it to the level of ECG or imaging in digital technologies. Very, very cool. Um, I am curious to know, and we'll go back because there's so much to ask. Um, but I'm curious to know in, yeah, remote patient monitoring is something that is a buzzword that, uh, again, it's one of the things people have been talking about for ever since digital health started. And it seems like it had a mini re renaissance also with, with telehealth, maybe a smaller one than telehealth. But I'm curious to know what. Um, what wearables slash you know wearable uh, combination with software did, did, have you seen implemented in, in health systems um, so far, and especially in the past few years? Like, what kind of rollouts have been the most successful, the most exciting? Well, I would say if if it's for me the question, right? Yes. Um, well, I would say I, one of the I guess the most broad uh, usages of wearable technologies that I've seen so far is ECG. Uh, but not in the way of uh, wrist ECGs or intermittent ECGs. Like a life course, I think a life course has had a, a limitation on sales because of the intermittent cap capability of its product, but more like patches. Uh, patches only when you can, for specific usages. So I think companies in, in, the, in the industry of patches, they don't really understand what the usages of their technologies are. Like you're, you're not gonna you know, diagnose a, a coronary event because you don't have anatomical information when, you, when you're using a patch. But you can definitely diagnose arrhythmias. So uh, what we are looking right now uh, is that companies like, bio, like Biotelemetry in the United States, they have really, I guess, pioneered in the, in the space of, of wearable uh, devices for one lead ECGs. And um, they are doing a great job, in, uh, mostly for post uh, admission patients, so recurrence of several types of arrhythmias that are corrected uh, with different types of interventions, and then the patients have a high risk of uh, you know recurrence. So those types of monitoring work, and um, <clears throat> we also see some other technologies like spirometries at home that are being used for specific types of patients, mostly in the COPD space. That's exciting, and I also like to ask uh, one last question for you, Jonathan. What have you seen not work? Like, what, what are some of the remote patient monitoring projects that just like sunk and what's your best guess? I, I have seen several projects that didn't work. I'm not gonna name any companies, uh, but I can tell you the, the essence of the technology. For instance, I think photoplethysmography is very difficult to implement into, tech, into medicine especially when we talk about cardiac usage, just because we can't supervise a photoplethysmography wave as a physician. So I, can't, I just have to blindly trust on a value that an algorithm is telling me. And the algorithm has 96% sensitivity, 80-something percent specificity. That's not enough. So when, when we see photoplethysmography developers, we're talking about 
Corsano Health or you know, uh, Apple, Fitbit, uh, all of them have a really interesting usage of technology for the consumer, but when we go into the medical space to give it a real clinical place in the process of diagnosis or, or screening, they're not there yet. Awesome. Thank you. That's a brief answer. Aditi, um, coming from your, again, like the, the healthcare system background, what have you been seeing as the most promising in integration of technology so far, at least in the recent years? Yeah, so there's a lot, but uh, I'm going to say also remote, remote patient monitoring and hospital at home. And I think it's interesting you asked about it being a small version uh, of telehealth. It's actually not. I actually consider telemedicine the base of all of this, right? It's the base of how do we do virtual care and remote and get people in the house or get healthcare in remote places. The next natural step is actually remote patient monitoring, bringing in extra data now that we have the tools to have these visits at home and using that going further. So we're seeing the next step of what virtual care is, and it is remote patient monitoring. So there's a lot of emphasis on that because people want better data when they're implementing or doing their healthcare. So I'm, I'm seeing a lot of that. So, you know, I was talking about how we work with a lot of specialists or work with a lot of specialists. And so cardiologists, neurologists, um, obviously even primary care doctors, they wanted better data from whatever their patients are doing at home. Because if you're gonna have a long standing relationship with your patient and you're gonna use virtual care and we are going toward a hybrid model, you're gonna see they wanted something better than that. And then hospital at home is a really interesting model to me because all that means is that we're taking what used to be hospital beds and being able to do that at home. So in the emergency department, so that's my specialty, we, we in the US, a lot of us will host and run observation units, which is a step down from a full inpatient bed. The idea is that they're gonna be out of the hospital, usually in less than 24 hours. And so we've been able to take a lot of the newer innovation uh, and the monitoring and be able to convert some of our most common patients into the home and do that. There's been a lot of investment, a lot of companies that do that are getting a lot of uh, buzz and interest from healthcare systems. Uh, the issue, like everything, is that you know, with the hospital at home specifically, there's very few companies that actually deliver it in a way that works. And so you're gonna see the same two, I'm not gonna say, but same two really everywhere and being used everywhere. Uh, and so we're in the danger, they're great companies, so I'm not saying that, but the danger is, it's almost like when we started out in telemedicine, uh, it may not be a fully thought out process yet, so we're, we'll have to see where that goes. Interesting, that makes me think, do you, do you believe the, that it, the same company can deliver the remote patient monitoring and the telemedicine kind of platform or basic architecture? Or is the, is it, do companies need to be like specific, specific about like their approach? And I think the misconception is that the reality is telemedicine is not that difficult. All you're doing is trying to connect two people. So most of these hospital at home uh, platforms, they do just that. What the difference is, is are bringing up the data and aggregating it in a way, especially data that's useful for the clinician. And that's the difference, right? A basic telemedicine platform doesn't necessarily need to do that, especially the ones that we had to implement quickly. This is just a further continuation of what is necessary for that. Thank you. Tamsin, um, I really love what you're doing and uh, the idea that you have found a problem and as a physician you've done what all of us physicians don't lack usually, which is uh, initiative and, <laughs> and going out of your comfort zone, right? right, right. Uh, and that was something that you felt compelled to take action yeah, for and yeah. then solve the solution in a very uh, specific way for your target users too. So tell us a little bit about the process and uh, tell us a little bit about also the product that you came up with. Oh, thank you. Um, I think the process started when I was seeing a pattern, which is what you're hoping data is always going to shortcut in the future, which is after 10 years in paediatrics, you start to see patients turning up where you're like, oh, they've had hearing loss, hearing loss, hearing loss, hearing loss, learning difficulties. So why don't we treat the hearing loss early, straight away? We know that that's going to make a difference. And, and then, of course, the hearing aids that were available were too expensive and, and um, 
no one wanted to give that to one in ten children. So um, it we just needed to have something that worked. <coughs> and then trying to use something that was used somewhere else, a little cycling, this little cycling headset that was cyclists were using at the time. They're quite, you see them got quite a lot now, don't you? But at the time, they were only really being sold to cyclists. So they were wearing them like this to cycle. And then they could pair this to their phone so that they could hear their trainer. But that they could then, it, because it doesn't cover your ears, um, their ears were still open for hearing traffic noises and traffic sounds so they didn't get run over. And so they were just using it for that. And then you're thinking, well, it's the same technology because that technology, it, because it doesn't cover the ears, it's, using, it's sending sound as a vibration through the bones of the skull directly to the inner ear. And all these kids, they've got problems with their middle ear. So if you're just rooting round the middle ear to the inner ear, it doesn't matter what's happening, you know, if it's bad or if it's getting a little bit better, it doesn't matter, you're just rooting the sound round. So then um, the, you can just, you compare these to a little microphone that the teacher can wear and the child can hear the teacher or the parent or the speech and language therapist who wears the lapel microphone, or these can um, pair to a tablet. And then, of course, just needed to make an app so that they could, um, the app could have speech and language games and listening games and um, parts of the app. In fact, there's a home hearing screen as well. And then uh, no one was interested in any of it um, because uh, it was, um, the app was free and because I'd done charity collaboration and everyone was like, I think that's great, but I don't know anything about apps. And I realised then that in order to even start the conversation with <laughs> colleagues, I had to start about the benefits of digital health. And, oh my gosh, there are so many benefits of digital health in children, and no one's really using that. They've got, um, they walk in with a device most of the time. They love the devices, unlike us adults who are fed up with them, that they, they can't wait to use them. And what I'd love to see is children being enabled, because that was something that I found in the research, was that you give these devices and an app to a child and say, tell me when it's useful, tell me when you need it. And they come back and they're so proactive. They were tiny little mites. They were four, five, six years old and they want to be in charge of their own health just like the rest of us. They wanted to take these and make sure they were charged because there's no batteries so you charge them overnight. And they wanted to make sure they were in their bag and they wanted to make sure that because they needed to hear. And they're good at using apps and they tell their parents. And in fact, they're the Trojan horse for half the family because they say, oh, by the way, you just press that and that and that. And, and so what I'd love to see is children being enabled to manage their health because their health <laughs> is looking pretty vulnerable in future. And it's going to be digital and there's probably going to be a digital front door for them. And we ought to teach them early about that. And I'd love to see app libraries within schools that support their health. I love that vision and um, and the fact that you didn't just take the initiative to build the technology but also to educate the rest of doctors about how to use it. So it's it's something that makes us think really about yeah it's um, it's not just about building the thing it's also about advocating for it uh, frequently right and um, it's really admirable what you did. Before we close, is there anyone in the audience that would like to ask any of the panelists a question? It's your chance to. Play with us. <laughs> okay. Well, let's let's close on a on a on some thoughts on you know one or two things that you want to see more of when it comes to innovation medicine, and one or two things that you want to see less of. And we'll start with Tamsin. Okay. Um, so children get children's health gets a little bit left behind, and I think it's because children don't vote, and so uh, there's never any funding in children's health. And I think that that is a big area, particularly digital health. Um, I'd love to see children being much more opted to co-produce and switch it up. I mean, there's so much that could be done there. And I would love to see preventative health because you make a one degree shift on a child, you change their trajectory just that much. And over time, that goes a long way. So um, I'd love to see us doing more preventative health for younger children. So um, in general, I like to see better clinical outcomes. So one of my projects is looking at research outcomes for the US digital health market. And I realize there is a disconnect in that, and this is where clinicians tend to have a barrier in wanting to adopt things. So there's a real opportunity for bigger and more open discussion for that. And so that's one of the things, again, I talk about. Um, 
that's probably the biggest thing right now. But I just want to say, you know, I graduated medical school like 15, 16 years ago, and the fact that I knew that bone conduction works to here, that you created a very simple thing to fix uh, a problem that exists, that's like the beauty of having medicine and tech together, and I think that's really incredible. And also, it's, it's really, it makes me like curious again about the human body, it's really amazing. I agree. Jonathan, why don't you close us off with uh, what you want to see in innovation medicine and one thing you want to see less of, too? Well, first I want to say what you just said and what you just said is brilliant. Um, I mean, if you think about it in medicine history, you know, physicians have invented the thermometer, the blood pressure uh, devices, the stethoscope, the x-rays, and blah, 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 blah. So why are we in, in this era not trusting the doctors and why are we supposed to be the liability on technology implementation when we are actually the gatekeepers and the curators of technology with validation. So I think that what we are asking for is really simple. It's all about outcomes. So I love that. And um, sometimes the simplest solutions are the most powerful ones, uh, which is actually the same thing that we do in Lapsi Health, what, what Tamsin is doing with her technology. And then the other thing that I don't want to see is I really would like to stop listening so much about overhyped stuff. <laughs> just like really honestly, there's a lot of overhyping stuff there. You know, we're talking about um, things that are very much far from the reality of, of, our, of our clinic. And this is why doctors sometimes are fed up with, with those, things, those things. Digital health gives a brilliant and massive opportunity to really revolutionize healthcare if we use it in the right way. And if we report the data in the right way for the physicians. And um, my conclusion is always involve a physician in all your projects because they're going to be the sound of reason and a little angel and devil on your shoulders. What a great way to end this panel. Thank you guys, you've been amazing. Thank you so much.